Michelle, how are you doing? I'm well, David. How are you? Good, good. L Michelle, I'm so excited. We have with us today Jeff Fox. You and I have been talking about this for a while. Yes. Jeff is one of the people who's brought the concept of liquid lead to the world. And I'm going to guess that's something that many of, many of you in our audience have not heard of. But we're hoping to share this really exciting idea with you. And so without further ado, Jeff, welcome to Talk.Dance. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. So, Jeff, I became aware of you because you gave a really excellent TED Talk at the TEDx in Montreal, I think it was 2015? 2015, yeah. And you and your co-presenter, Trevor Kopp, mm -hmm. um, shared with the, the audience and then kind of the world through TED, the concept of liquid lead, which is about changing the lead follow roles as you dance. And mm -hmm. I, I thought it was really intriguing. So I wanted to have you here on the, on the show and share that with uh, our audience. So if you could tell us a little bit about how you got started, where did this idea come from? Where the heck did you get this idea? <laughs> um, well, and we talk a little bit about it in the actual video that uh, it, it was almost kind of an accidental discovery, I guess, put it that way. Uh, Trevor and I were both professional ballroom dance instructors, and uh, that's actually kind of how we had encountered each other. We had met uh, through the organization that we taught through. Um, and at workshops, when you get a lot of dance professionals and dance teachers together and you're doing dance sessions and training sessions, uh, you end up kind of swapping the, the roles to, you know, try, you want to try leading the pattern or the technique and then turn around and let the other person do it. Uh, and then in the general social mixing, you do a little bit more of that. And as he and I became friends, we would end up going to kind of social events and uh, his significant other ran a theater company uh, at that point. So we would end up going to a lot of the rap parties uh, and just dancing for fun, but then wanting to kind of take turns because we both lead all the time. So to mix it up, he would lead, then I would lead. Um, but rather than trying to switch, have the role switch for an entire song, we got into the habit of just kind of switching while we were dancing and like, oh, I've got an idea. I want to try this. Okay, your turn. I'm out of idea. So it was just a way of kind of playing and having fun with the dance. Um, and it was just something that we did and, and didn't really think all that much about. Uh, and then we got asked by a friend of Trevor's who was organizing a small theater festival here in Kitchener, actually. Uh, it was the first open, uh, first LGBTQ theater festival that, uh, that the area had had. Uh, and he, one of his uh, performers had had to back out and he was looking to fill the time slot uh, and asked us if we would do a little bit of dancing. Ah. And so we figured, well, okay, we've, you know, at that point, Dancing with the Stars hadn't really hit yet. Uh, so ballroom wasn't really a narrative style very often. Uh, and coming both from a theater background, we went, okay, well, there's some storytelling we could try here. So we actually put a, a rumba routine together. That was the story of two men kind of encountering each other in a club and sizing each other up and flirting a little bit. And there was some lift work. And, um, but we used salsa just as a warm up, uh, which we, Trevor's favorite dance. He's is kind of a, a salsa tourist at this point. I think 16 countries and counting is, oh, is the wow. A man found salsa in Yellowknife for crying out. You can sign, you can find it anywhere. <laughs> um, but uh, we used the salsa as just kind of as a warm up to to get the room going. And we would, as we were dancing salsa, we just kept switching, um, which is just what we do. And that was almost kind of to warm us up as well before we before we did the lift work. And uh, there was a, a playwright and dramaturg there, and she came back the following night to see the the show again. And she was really struck by that switching back and forth. Like she found the rum interesting, but the salsa, even as a non-dancer, she could tell we were taking turns and it didn't change. Like she was noticing there was a, a real lack of specific masculine or feminine or male, female roles in how we were dancing. And it was just an even exchange back and forth. There was no contest to it. And just the, the very balanced partnership of that really kind of struck her. Um, and as we said in the, in the talk, the infamous thing, she pulled us aside and said like, do you have any idea how political what you just did was like, I know you were just dancing, but there was a lot more to it than that. And uh, we ended up getting together and teaming up with her to create a play based on the idea of that even partnership and of, of leading versus following and, and being stuck on, on one side of that and, and the, the kind of the quest for finding an even balance between the two. 
Uh, and it was kind of through that process of building the play that the ideas around really kind of looking at leading and following and the roles that people get stuck into and all of the kind of societal and gender role and relationship role kind of gunk that gets clumped onto that without us even really realizing it, which kind of gave rise to the one uh, line that we gave to Trevor, that it was gender training. It wasn't just dance training. There was a, there was a real kind of societal historical paradigm that was kind of inferred and implicit in that relationship that the man was always going to lead, the woman was always going to follow, his lines were always big and strong and spread out and masculine and hers were curved and, uh, and feminine. And it just the more we unpacked that, uh, the more stuff just kind of kept coming out and coming out. And we ended up with the play uh, called First Dance, which we toured quite a bit, and uh, are actually performing again this fall. Um, took it oh, to nice. Albania, of all places. If you can wait. In Albania? Now, because that's where you go when you have when you have a, a play a two-person play that's mainly movement that's based in same-sex ballroom dancing albania is where you go that's the half oh, the fun of that was just telling people we were going to albania because i was uh, as a small aside it was a, a person trevor had encountered she was originally from albania and with her uh, she worked at a university and with a professor there they had founded an international dance festival and so she saw the saw us dancing saw the talk and got in touch with uh with Jerge over in Albania and he brought us over so we ended up performing uh, a couple of times in Albania as part of that festival which was uh, an amazing amazing experience it was, it, was, it was a very different part of the world and yeah uh, but was really well received and even Jerge was really kind of surprised and very very happy and very proud to, to bring that to that part of the world because I think it was the year before we went it was voted the most homophobic country in Europe um, so to have us go and perform that and have it well received and have audiences really kind of struck and talking about it and uh, so that was an amazing sort of we've had a few of those with the play and with the talk of just these random invitations to go we did we ended up doing a, um, a TED talk presentation in Ireland a couple of years ago as part of a feminist festival there um, but the the building of the the play really kind of expanded our kind of conversations about that. Uh, and we were touring the play and we were just about done with the tour when one of Trevor's former students and a friend of his, who is a curator for content at TEDx Montreal, approached us about potentially doing a talk about it because um, she had seen us and heard all these conversations and, and the idea, just like with Lisa, there was something there that really struck her, that there was an idea that was more than just the dance uh, and more just a mechan more than a mechanical system for, for tweaking a, a system of dancing. There was a, a broader idea there that could be expressed. Um, so she pitched us. We were a bit of an odd fit for them because it was two, two speakers. Uh, we were moving. Uh, so they had to mic both of us. They actually had to pull the red dot up off the stage because we couldn't dance on it. We tested, didn't go very well. Uh, <laughs> so they, they had to kind of send the MC out to distract the audience while the tech guys came out and pulled the dot off the stage so that we could go out there. Um, and it was an amazing experience just to go. And it was all of the conversations we had had kind of in the background of building the play that then focused specifically just on those themes and, and, and brought them through and then got a chance to, to present that. Uh, at TEDx Montreal, and um, it was well received. People in the room were were, were very very receptive, uh, and unbeknownst to well, we knew there was an intern from New York uh, that was there at the event because TEDx Montreal has a very strong reputation. The, the the crew that run that event really go all out, and they only do it every two years to make sure they've really got it tightened up, and the production quality is outstanding. Uh, so the the New York intern was very impressed, and we didn't realize that after that weekend, she went back to New York and started pushing. Uh, TED.com and, and, and pitching the idea and had them. Uh, so about seven or eight months after it had gone live from Montreal, we got ended up with a Skype call uh, that TED.com wanted to pick it up. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were going to feature it as a talk of the day, which only happens to maybe 200 or so TEDx talks per year. Uh, and, you know, thousands and thousands of them get uh, produced, uh, but only a couple hundred get picked up. And so we went through the process of tweaking that and, and getting all the, the appropriate music rights and those kinds of things. Uh, and then it went live. Uh, and, and then the conversations have changed since then. So the people contacting us, it's been interesting. The, the talk has gone places that the play couldn't get to. Uh, so we've mm -hmm. been able to have like trips, the trips to Ireland and we've, we've even been within, uh, did some workshops within a women's correction facility. Uh, last year oh, you're just totally ramped up because of that that's great yeah so it's and, and it's it just it gets into spaces that wouldn't have gotten beforehand and because again of the, the, the reach of Ted um, but then also that 20 minute kind of here's the idea sort of space so it, it opened it up to other people who rather than hiring a 
theater production to come in, there was something else. It was a little more user friendly and you could put it in just about any spot. Um, and that's kind of what got us to the, to, to the world stage of it. So almost like a life changing uh, moment. It really was, and I mean, the, one of the things we we do a lot of work with students, and uh, I, I make a point of uh, of always telling people to say yes to things, <laughs> because you really never know where they're going to go. We said yes to help helping the, our friend Johnny with that theater festival, which then led to the play, which then led to the th like. It's you never know how, what those dominoes are gonna are, are gonna unfurl. So always say yes to things. Always say yes to things. That's that's fascinating. Wow. So, uh, how did you come up with the term? I love the term because I I thought. There's all kinds of things that you could just say, you know, role changing or something that are kind of boring, but I love the term liquid lead. Where did that come from? Uh, that, that actually came out of the theater, uh, the, the, the play building. That's what happens when you put three theatrical script writing people in a room together. Uh, that was one of the things that fascinated Lisa a lot about dance is just the dance language is inherently theatrical. Uh, even just the names of steps, feather finish and, and twinkles and whisks and it just it inherently sounds theatrical, you don't have to do anything to it. Um, but just finding that phrasing, so you get three script writers in a room and you start looking for, uh, for things, but it was that, that idea of, it was next door to gender fluid, which was definitely something we wanted to have there. Um, and the idea of being able to pass leadership back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, was, was very much kind of at the forefront. Uh, and I mean, there, the, there were terms, you know, degendering or partner swapping or that, like, so the, the idea has been around and it's had a few different names. Uh, but that one, it's one of those things you come up with it and everybody in the room goes, ah, yes, you know, check mark. All right. Yeah, and I, I'm going to interject very quickly only sure. because uh, I want to make a mention at, at how relevant the name mm -hmm. is because I have, um, I have a 16 year old son who I was, with yesterday, I think, David, when you said, go get a camera, because I need to make sure I'm ready for this. And uh, we were shopping and I was telling him, I'm going to be on this podcast and we're discussing this great topic about Liquid Lead. And uh, he, of course, knows that I'm the owner at the dance studio. And he went, oh, he goes, oh, I get it. So just like going back and forth with the role between the man and the woman. And I was like, yes. So even if you can tap into the comprehension of a 16 year old who has nothing to do with the dance world, the title is indicative enough to give you an idea of what it's about. So yeah. kudos to you. It's a good title. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 again, it's one of those ones where you were taught, you try this, try this, and then it goes, you hear it and you're like, yep, yep, that's the one. That, <laughs> that says it. Yes, yes. So where has, uh, where has it gone in, in some sense? Where do you see the liquid mm. lead movement going <laughs> since the TED Talk? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it's been fascinating because at, at some point we do, like on one level we, or some levels, we do have ideas of what we would like to see with it. And then we keep getting the random things that we would never have anticipated. Um, as I said, like the, the, the trip to Ireland was kind of a last minute thing. It was uh, called the F Festival. Uh, and it was like the end of January. They sent us an email. It was like, if we, if we pay for flights, will you come to, to Dublin in March? <laughs> sure. Because... <laughs> uh, you say yes to things, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it was a lovely, lovely, lovely trip to do it. Um, but I mean, we have, uh, we've gone into high schools doing um, the group, the GSAs, the, the Gay Straight Alliances within the high schools. Uh, quite a few have brought us in. We've been, been at GSA conferences um, to do workshops with group facilitators, but then also been brought into specific schools to run workshops uh, for the students. Uh, musical theater summer camp uh, brought us in. Uh, so we've done a lot of work kind of at high school level with, with student populations, um, which is lovely because the, the, the gender side of it doesn't, like the fact that two men are dancing together, that, that doesn't, they don't bat an eye at that, which is absolutely lovely. And we always point that out. Uh, but the role, freedom to, to be whoever you are and then be, have different roles that you can play and to not always have to play a particular role and to switch that, but that you can be consistent in who you are, regardless of that, that resonates really strongly. Um, We've uh, part of I, some of the most an, unanticipated one, Planned Parenthood um, has reached out and brought us down. We've been down for a couple of events now. Uh, the first one was a full weekend um, uh, from the education uh, wing in Planned Parenthood. There's a, a facilitator down there who works a lot with high school students and is very big in the dance community. So salsa and bachata. And, mm -hmm. uh, and she wanted to use the two to, to spend the weekend talking about consent. Um, and the idea of nice. giving consent, offering consent, the negotiation of consent, and how that um, dance becomes a really literal metaphor 
um, for that and a very way, a way to physically embody that. So she brought us down uh, both kind of as keynote present presenters for the end of the, the weekend, but also to run, I think we have about three different workshops over the course of the days that we were down there uh, with local dancers and, and, and just that idea of, well, this is how to lead, this is how to follow, and this is how to exchange those things back and forth and, and what that feels like. If I think about that on a Planned Parenthood perspective. I just think that's an interesting platform in salsa and bachata reference. Just, you know, the invitation to send your partner out for a turn is yeah. an invitation. So we're talking about consent. We're talking about offering. So really an interesting way to tie it in. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a lovely weekend. And I mean, she, she had kind of the perfect title. She used the font from the TV show, but called it So You Think You Consent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was absolutely like she had some swag we've kept the sunglasses like it was it was she had us at that like we were in we we, we were sold on it um and then we were since we since went back down as uh to help with fundraising donor events uh to present there did some workshops again with some high school students um the women's correctional facility was was uh, a very very fascinating sort of experience there was a, a group that had a grant to go into the, the prison to work with the inmates to create to work with theater you know, kind of theater as therapy as as um, and it was a grant to do research around the effectiveness of that uh, and they brought us in uh, to work with them to help physicalize the theater uh, and to talk a little about that about the liquid lead idea we ended up doing a full presentation to the open to the, the full population of the facility and then came back a second week and worked specifically just with the theater group uh, to, to work with their thing which was uh, an outstanding experience, I guess. Daunting as an idea, but once we were actually there and working with the women, it was it was uh, an amazing, amazing kind of experience. Um, so it's we've had a chance to to be part of festivals, to and even dance congresses. So kind of like jazz and contemporary congresses and Kingston and things have brought us in to be presenters and, and, and workshops. Um, so it, every time we turn around, it's it's different people are resonating with it in different ways. Um, uh, it was just the other day, there was a, a comment on the, the TED's spot, uh, another woman had watched the video and, and really resonated with the idea of if that freedom in switching roles or, or being able to wear different hats within relationships was more, more open, there would be a lot of, un, as she put it, unpleasant things could be avoided. Um, that just the, and that was what originally sparked Lisa was that very even partnership. Um, that just because you're leading now doesn't mean you always have to lead tomorrow and the day after and the day after or in this situation maybe you you, you have the experience and if this is your turf but then someone the next moment that we're on the other turf we're on some we're on different ground so it would make more sense for someone else to, to have the lead so um, we I mean, we've pitched the idea the one that got away there was a UN uh, conference um, for uh, ch global charities run by women uh, and the organizer reached out and was wanting to bring us in. And we're like, <laughs> and she pitched it. It didn't quite make it past the board stage. So there's still a little bit of a bottom lip about that one getting away. Um, mm. But it, it's, it's just that idea resonates on different outside of the dance. Uh, the dance, I mean, it certainly does within dance, uh, but that it is resonating on so many other levels levels and platforms and, and in, in other spheres that's what we're, we're loving so much is and it's a chance to have those kind of conversations and use the dance just as a demonstration rather than just specifically trying to alter the dance machine itself oh, excellent excellent so you mentioned uh, a number of the venues that you presented this idea at. a number of them were kind of inherently more same sex focused in one way or another, right? Either it's a woman's prison or, or, or yeah. so forth. Do you see this being picked up and taking off in pockets here and there, just within dance communities in general, regardless of gender? You, I mean, you made that point in the TED Talk, it, gender has really nothing to do with the physics of dance. Yeah. I thought was a great line. But I know I get a lot of interesting looks when I, I switch roles with my wife and I, yeah, it's fine. I, I think it's, I think it's fun. I think it's a lot yeah. of fun. I, some people watch the, oh, there goes David again, right? <laughs> but if we were dancing and we did the liquid lead, it would be less alarming than with your wife only because she's significantly smaller than you. So that's true. That interpretation, right, that people have and yep. we end up going with specific ideas. 
So if you and I were dancing, we're much closer in height, it wouldn't be that alarming. But yes, your wife is this sweet little hundred pound. And then there's this <laughs> massive foot or more in between the two. Yeah, I'm like about 10 inches taller <laughs> or yeah. something like that. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. Do you see that happening in any social venues more these days or? Yeah. Um, I, I got kind of two prongs to that. I mean, one, uh, we've, we've done workshops and I've actually just, just in the process of doing a series here in Guelph, uh, speaking of Guelph, um, uh, with just general dance population. Uh, and even the, what the weekend we were down there for the, the Planned Parenthood consent weekend, it, w it was just a dance community. We had, it was a couple of the workshops we did were actually just, it was the, the weekly salsa bachata night at this particular restaurant that they just brought us in and we had everybody there switching. And I mean, they're really wonderful to end. We, we see it when it happens is we run the workshop and then this was a dance night. So we just let them, you know, kind of stood back and we were around, we danced with some of the people that had come, but everybody kept trying it over the course of the night. So men who had never followed were, were being led by their partners and they were just trying it and having fun with it and enjoying it because it had already been established as being okay in that space because the workshop was right before us. So everybody was experimenting and, and having fun with it and realizing, oh, okay, I can, it's just, it's just switching and it's, it's fun to twirl every once in a while and, um, and doing very beginner classes or, you know, part of kind of one-off sort of one-time workshops where people can just kind of sign in. So it's very simple thing, but to see people getting a chance to turn things around and wives leading their husbands and, you know, figuring out where the arms go and all this kind of, um, and, and having fun with that and realizing, well, that itself is just play. So it, it takes the stakes out of it. It takes the consequences and uh, the societal kind of pressure out of it. And just we're, we're experimenting and having fun with that and try it out and see what you can do with it. So it, it's certainly, it's not as hard to engender in a room as, as you might anticipate, especially socially, as long as we, you know, if you're able to set the tone for it. Uh, and that's one thing that we, we often kind of comment about, about Trevor and I, that we will go out dancing and do salsa dancing in clubs and places in social settings where you would really not think two men in dance hold would go over very well. Mm. Uh, like very, very kind of ultra Latin, full of machismo kind of places. And, and just, you know, even the two of us would be like, okay, well, we're, 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 we're going to do it. We'll, we'll just go. And part of, and we've, we've never set the alarms off. Like no one, has, even, you know, the most kind of died in the wool at the risk of kind of making assumptions. The person you would think would be the least, impressed to see two men dancing together these guys would come over and like you guys are good dancers what was that trick you were doing like they were just asking mm. about the dancing it, it was like they they missed the they'd forgotten or just not noticed the fact that it was two men dancing like they, they it didn't seem to bother them uh and part of that we, we always attribute to the fact that when trevor and i were dancing and, and kind of what lisa resonated is there's not a lot of I mean, we're just dancing. So there's not a lot of posturing. So if we're leading, we don't put on the typical or expected kind of upright and puffed out and masculine. And when we're following, we don't suddenly go feminine. We just keep dancing the way we always dance, regardless of which side of the, the, the role we're playing, you know, which one, which one we're in. Um, so then it, it de really quite truly degenders it, it desexualizes it. It's just about dancing. Uh, and so it takes the, the threat especially when you start bumping into issues of masculinity and perceived masculinity, it takes the threat out of that because it's just dancing and there's no consequences of being perceived as being follow. It makes following not a f automatically a feminine thing. So then maybe it's okay to play with that. So to get that into the room and then people just kind of let a breath out and, and have fun with it and, and, and enjoy kind of the, especially the goofiness of now, okay, I don't even, I, I've forgotten how to walk again now because I, I don't, this is backwards. And so what do you do with your hand? Um, and I always refer to that as, as good, good, healthy partner empathy. So even if you're not going to do switching, it's really good to, to, to dance a few laps in the other person's shoes, just so you know what your, what your poor partner goes through from both sides in terms of what it's like to try and follow, what it's like to try and lead. Yeah, I actually think it's regardless of whether you plan to do it socially or, or even competitively, it is mm -hmm. very helpful to try changing roles just to help become a better dancer. You can become a better leader by experiencing the follow role and vice versa. No, no, no. Right. And that we, Trevor and I talk about like the, the very initial grains of what led to this was those dance sessions and seminars when we would get together. And that was part of what we were trying to learn was like, oh, okay, you can, uh, so what am I gonna ask? We need to follow this because I need to know what it is I'm gonna ask my student 
to do. So then I can talk intelligently about, well, this is what your body's going to feel like, and this is what you're going to need to do. So I, rather than look at it or feel it from the outside, to be able to feel that from the inside and to also feel what the lead feels like when it works and when it doesn't work. So it, it, you needed that. And um, in, in the, the farther you go into dancing, it really like leading, you still have to follow while you're leading. You have, to be, you have to be aware of where your partner is. You can't just kind of steamroll through things. You know, where, what foot are they on? Are they done with the action that you set in motion before you go on to the next thing? Are they tangled up in their feet? Um, so that there's an awareness of your partner. You're not just kind of blithely, you know, tossing out ideas and dictating terms. Um, so to really truly understand how to lead, you know, you need to understand how to follow and what that feels like. And, um, and I, I think that it's certainly imperative on a teacher's perspective, right? It's, Absolutely. You have um, to have both sides, but you also need to do that in order to teach it, right? So there's a certain level of comprehension you have to have on all aspects of it. Yeah, and, and especially if, if, even if I'm not teaching liquid lead, I, uh, when, when teaching couples, I, I do make a point of every once in a while, and sometimes it makes it a lot easier to just get in frame with, with, with the leader mm -hmm. and let them feel what it is that we're asking them to because then they can turn around and reproduce the feeling rather than talk at them for half an hour and try and explain it intellectually and in theory <laughs> 20 seconds of feeling it in their own body like oh you want me to okay that's what that feels. okay right? or don't do this because this is what it feels Ooh, okay that feels bad i'm not going to do that to them anymore um but it's also that it, then they get that experience of what that feels like and mm -hmm. and, and to yeah. be able to relate to it um so in a social setting it's as long as there are a few people who are, are able to just kind of comfortably get that into the space it doesn't necessarily it's certainly a lot easier in a same-sex dance environment there's a lot more openness there um but if it's if i guess in terms of if it's just about dance and you've got people who can kind of curate that mood it's not as hard as as even on paper we might have assumed it would have would have been uh from the other side of things the seeing that even within the dance community uh the swing section of the, of the universe uh, that is has always been a little more comfortable with with swapping things around but it has become much more of a staple of having lead and follow switching and they're you know they're even kind of taking the jack and jill terminology out of there and and just j and j or we felt like they're, they're letting people swap and switch and play uh and and making a point of teaching men to follow and, and ladies to lead so that's been much more a part of the swing universe and it's coming more and more to the forefront which is lovely to see uh and then of course since last year with uh with the ndca making their switch in the rules um removing all reference to gender in terms of qualify what is a qualified couple um, now we're starting to see a lot more of that. Even the conversations are really starting because now the, the possibilities are wide open. So um, as opposed to specifically just within same, the same sex dance circuit, now all of these conversations are coming more and more into mainstream ballroom settings. Um, and it's, it, it's provoking the right kinds of questions. It's starting the right kind of conversations uh, and, and shaking things up the way, the, in, in some really lovely ways. So I think in, in, conventional mainstream ballroom settings, it's getting easier to have that conversation because it's starting to show up um, already. Uh, and, and, and people are kind of needing to have these conversations and figure it out because now they, they look left and there's a there's a, an unconventional couple on the floor with them and, and, and or seeing people on the floor and being really kind of fascinated by what they see. Uh, so the, the things are Jeff are moving much more forward than they were even even a year or two ago. Right, right. We're at a state of that evolving right here and now over the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot more of that yeah. present, you know, I don't know if that's, is that in your studio when you're, you're teaching out of Fred Astaire in, mm -hmm. uh, correct Jeff? Yeah, in Kishner, yeah, um, a little bit. Uh, and it's, it, it's one of those things like I, I've, I don't have a lot of students that are actively pursuing liquid lead. Um, I, it ends up kind of waking its way into the, in the I can't help it. Um, so it shows up in its, in, 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 in its ways. Uh, as, as I'm doing a lot of workshops and, and, and training sessions uh, around Ontario and occasionally down into the States. Um, so it, the awareness of it, and I think that's, you know, in a way it, it has a familiar whiff to it, um, mm -hmm. that when Dancing with the Stars first hit, then just talking about dance in general and the idea of partner dancing and that coming back into public awareness and, and it became cool again and so there are more and more people so I mean there were more more and more people going into dance studios um, especially one of the things that show did very very well and, and has has kind of kept going was the variety of people they would get on the show as, as contestants mm -hmm. uh, and literally had students say you know going well if Evander Holyfield can do it I can get off the couch like 
it just got people into the dancing space because it made it accessible. So the idea of dance then became a common conversation. So it has a bit of that same whiff that this aspect of dance is now becoming more common uh, with the rule change. Uh, and we're getting, speaking of the, the, the Dancing with the Stars format, I think it was in Australia, there was a, a male, a two men, a male pair that made the final. Uh, and I think Finland, is that Netherlands maybe? The, the guys won the show. Uh, they, they full out won the whole series. Um, so we're starting to see that even in those contexts. And so you think you can dance is pairing dancers of the same gender up more and being a little more open about the stories that they can tell. So it's, it's, it's more and more and more accessible, more forward and more visible, which, which is always helpful because then if it's visible, then not only do people see themselves represented in that, which is, which is absolutely crucial, um, but then it also opens the door to have those conversations and to have people kind of ask questions with a head scratch that then leads to some really, really important conversations. Right, right. And so just as a little bit of context for those in our audience who are unaware, the rule change that, Jeff, you're referring to is the National Dance Council of America back in, I think it was August of last year, 2019, changed the rules that allowed uh, now same-sex couples to compete and also redefine what it means to be a, a couple just generally, right? So yeah, the, their that, original definition, yeah, their oh, old definition sorry, I, of I'll eligible even. couple was a man leading and a woman following. Uh, and it was literally written into the rules and they've now removed all reference to, to gender in, in any connection with lead or follow. It was two people dancing together um, and, and they've, they've kind of opened the template and that's that amateur, pro-am, full professional, like just across the board. And that went into effect in September 23rd, I think was the, I think so. And in fact, some, some might be interested. We spoke about this a little bit on an earlier episode, episode five of 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, we had another guest on, uh, Nikolai Spakov, who starred in a documentary about same-sex ballroom competition. Mm -hmm. So previous to that rule change, really it was only specialized competitions where you could dance in same-sex. And, and in, some, in, in those competitions, sometimes you would see uh, some of the some of the couples would role change throughout the dance, but it, it wasn't always a thing. But it was very very much a new thing. And in fact, my uh, co-host uh, Kelly Palmer, who's usually on this show, is uh, out with uh, food poisoning today. Unfortunately, we believe he might have been the first one to dance same sex at a mainstream competition. He's not gay, but uh, him and a friend just on the spot said, hey, we could do this. And they did a very last minute thing, a show dance, uh, same sex, which was uh, kind of cool. Yeah, there were a few, I, I know there was a, a woman, Julian uh, DiBianco, who uh, connected with on Facebook. She and her part, she's been in, dancing in the same sex circuit. She has a, a female student that leads um, and they've been competing in the same sex circuit for a while. And then as soon as the doors are open, uh, yeah, there, was, there were a few contenders for that actual first couple that went on the floor at a mainstream event uh, mm -hmm. under new, the new rules and being able to be out there, which, uh, w which was really lovely to, to, to see that. So I'm, I'm curious because we did t uh, have a little bit of a debate on the topic of, uh, and I'm wondering what your views are on, mm. at a competitive level, if uh, role changing couples should compete against couples who don't change roles, regardless of gender. But yeah. should it be a, should it be a separate category, in your opinion, or not? No, uh, I, I, it's part of. I, I wear a couple of hats when when thinking of those things. I mean, on the one hand, one of the biggest overhauls with bringing those sort of things, it, it's the judges. So, what what are their parameters of what do I want to see? How do I compare it from a, and so what are the priorities and is it you know and to a certain degree it, be, it because dance also has such an artist artistic preference aspect to the judging of it i mean that's in, in a large way that's part of why the the um, olympic level the ioc uh <laughs> As much as we would love to see ballroom as an Olympic event, and that, and in terms of that level of athleticism, and absolutely, they brought it the one year as a as an exhibition just to test it out. They took one look at the ordinal judging system and like, no, uh, figure skating was bad enough. Um, but because of that, and I mean, you put twelve different judges around the outside of the floor, you you, you start to get different results even from one event. To the other. Sure. So I mean, there's so much room for personal taste that it's tough to 
structure that out. Uh, and, and so that, that's one of the biggest shifts. It's not even necessarily about the dancers uh, or about the dancing community, but if, it's, if it is competitive, so then what are the, what are the parameters? How do they judge that? Uh, and is it done effectively? And, and you know, in, in a case like that, if, they were, if role switching was, gonna, was more prevalent or was happening on the floor, do you then kind of, are you judging just the overall of average effectiveness of the lead and follow? Or are you, are you would, as a judge, are you turning around and like, well, if you're gonna do it, then I expect to see just a strong a lead and follow activity. Now that you've switched slides, I'm not gonna lower the, the bar of expectation because you've swapped roles. I, there's a lot of stuff, and those are kind of the, the, the layered kind of technical uh, debates. I would be um, tricky as an adjudicator, because if you think about the, you know, if you have this impression and you've watched maybe 15 seconds of a heat, mm -hmm. and you're impressed and you go and mark and then they switch roles and then all of a sudden you want to up or down your, your grade and your mark. Yeah. That's, that's really tricky. And there's on the side of even, you know, the typical couples that you would have a male and a female. The subjectivity of adjudicators is present no matter what. And I'm yeah. not judging adjudicators as much as that sounds rather tricky. It's just inherent with the art industry, whether you talk about figure skating or whether you talk about ballroom dancing. Naturally, you go out there and you see these things all of the time. So it's really difficult to even wash that out on what we're used to in a traditional perspective, never mind the potential of this new rule, right? And if there's role changing in that, it's just another layer, just as you were saying, it's tricky. Yeah, and especially that the that's that Polaroid snapshot judging that we do. It's like, okay, I've got my 15 sec on to the next thing. Well, what you know, and then they do something. I mean, if they draw your eyes back, that's always a good thing, uh, as as long as it's catching the eye, not like a rusty fish hook, um, as, as, as the phrase we use. But um, yeah, and and so how do you structure routines, and where are you going to put that? Yeah, that, you know that that sort of exchange and 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 to to, to mix it around. Um, so I think on some levels, I th if, if from a procedural standpoint, in terms of bringing that in, I think that having it, its own category to start with, so that there's a bridge between, well, it isn't present and it is present. So giving, if nothing else, giving adjudicators a chance to get used to watching and how do I adjudicate something that, you know, could be switching since the last time I looked at it. Yes, uh, and and, and give them a chance to figure that out uh, yeah. before then being able to open the... Are there any details right now in the new ruling that, of course, gender is, you're just looking for two people to be dancing. I understand yeah. the perspective, but is there any um, fine print on the roles? Or like, do you have to have a lead and follow consistent for the entire heat or? No, I th and I think the, uh, it's a good question because I remember there were some things within the, the same sex circuit where they were, they were requiring lead and there like some, some sets would require at some point in your routine, you had to switch at least once. Oh. Uh, I think the wording left it open that you were not required. You're not required to do it, but you were not required to stay Okay. Anyone, like I, I haven't looked at it last little bit. I probably should have before. Oh, I know. That's just an interesting spot. That's a, a good conversation. Yeah. I think, I think if, if memory serves reading it, they had left the door open that if you were going to switch, you could. Okay. Um, so that was permissible. It was not a requirement, but it was permitted. Mm. Um, and I, I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll say yes to that because I remember there's been a few clips. There was one couple um, that someone had sent the clip to and we actually chatted with um, the male female couple but they were both the costumes were a whole mixture and they were both in heels wow. and they were switching lead and follow while they were on the floor but they were at a mainstream event so they put everything together in one and they mixed they, the whole thing was a full mixture and we reached out because it was lovely to see and they actually said that they had they had watched the ted talk a couple of years ago and that had been one of the major sources of inspiration for how they were building their part which was just lovely to hear like that i, um, I think that might have been the, there's a quick uh, a clip that's being semi-viral uh, yeah it's gone it's gone pretty, yeah, pretty i think I, I know the one you're referring to yeah yeah so i'm i'm not sure what the ndca uh NDCA, yeah. Called, yeah sorry <laughs> rules say exactly i know when we were speaking with uh, our previous guest uh, nikolai mm -hmm. uh he believed that there was some uh some restrictions or they did there was some talk about separating categories uh, specifically yeah. around this so you could you could partner however you'd like uh, you could be a, a a woman leading a man. You could be a woman leading a woman, and and or man leading a man. Uh, but in some cases, they did not want rule switching uh, during the dance. Yeah. And I guess 
you know, the NDCA is just one of the dance organizations in the United States. And of course, there's many worldwide. So we're probably going to have various you know, forms of those rules and, and many places where uh, that flexibility is not yet accepted at all yet. So I know you're in Canada. Uh, yeah. what, what, what are the rules in Canada currently? Uh, well, in terms of uh, we, the the well, there's a couple. There was one Canadian organization, then there's no, there's two, and th um, okay. I, I haven't heard yet if they have adopted the the swap, the switch okay. yet. Um, so I haven't heard anything about a, a change in in the, in their mandate. I wouldn't be surprised if they're not too far behind, like because a lot of the events are connected and associated with NDCA events. There, there's some kind of feathering where it's, it's not, a, you know, ND, they'll accept NDCA membership as, as viable for, for their organization. So there is certainly a, a, a sibling kind of nature uh, with some of those organizations. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're, if they're not far behind, but I haven't heard anything about them actually making the, right. uh, making the switch yet. But in terms of those, those categories, the fact that, uh, I forget the full acronym, but the, the same sex, uh, North American Same Sex Dance Association, the the events that they have uh, and they hold regularly uh, across North America, the judges are used to because that has been part of the process. So there are adjudicators out there who have had to kind of figure out how to judge couples that are going to switch roles. So it's it's there, it's present, it has has started to be done. So there are people that other people could talk to and people who go, okay, and they run, you know, seminars on, okay, this is how you judge a category that has role swapping because there are the people who've had to do it now for several years uh, and getting the hang of it, which is lovely. So it's not a blank slate entirely. There are adjudicators out there who have experience uh, with, with judging that style of dance. So. Nice. Nice. So I, I just think this is so cool. The competitive scene aside, mm. it's such a cool concept to, to try out on the social dance floor. You've mentioned that you've run a number of workshops. If there are uh, people listening to this podcast who are running some form of dance weekend, uh, dance festival, and they'd like to engage you or Trevor, or the two of mm -hmm. you, that's something you, you do? You're taking those requests, are you? Yeah, we do. Uh, I'm, uh, that's how we ended up with the, the Planned Parenthood event and these, these workshops that I'm gonna, about to start in Guelph. Um, we've, we've been in, we've gone to corporate events. We've, as I said, we've been into high schools, the, 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 the corrections facility, just different dance weekends um, that just wanted another, like, you know, they had a waltz workshop and a thing workshop, and then they had us come in. So um, the, the nice. Liquid Lead Facebook page is probably the best. I, I was just going to ask what the best way to reach you. So the, uh, there's a Liquid Lead Facebook page. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Mm -hmm. I've got another question for you, just switching sure. gears, uh, a little bit uh, more lighthearted. Jeff, what is your favorite genre of dance? It's a little tough to say in terms of, we're talking within the ballroom. Yeah. Sure. Uh, um, well, any, any kind of partner dance. Yeah, well, I, cause uh, <laughs> I guess the, the ballroom dancer in me, it, it's, I like, I have kind of one leg in both families. Um, I'm, I'm very partial to waltz uh, in, in the ballroom space. Um, Samba is, is, is forever a love uh, in, in the Latin family. Uh, so I, I have my favorites in, in either. Uh, I am more built and suited physically and performance-wise for smooth. Um, tall, long limbs. Uh, and I, I'm not great at the muy macho kind of sexual tension sort of thing that, that Latin requires to a degree. Uh, it's been a note. I've been working on it. Um, but certainly enjoy the, the rhythms and the intricacies. So, I mean, I, there's things we take from either. Uh, the I guess you could say my kind of full true home is a little next door to the ballroom world. Having been involved in theater and, and building the stage, I've done a lot of, I guess lyrical would be the, the best, the closest mm -hmm. term, uh, okay. lyrical contemporary using partnering work uh, and lift work. Uh, and, and, but as a, as a storytelling medium, as a narrative medium, um, not, as a, and a performative uh, staged uh, space. Uh, as, as a writer and a choreographer, been able to do some work in that space, having done theater arts training and lift work training, uh, but then this as well, and, and and the fluidity of that, and have been able to, to create some some movement theater pieces that I've then toured to festivals and, and performed in. So that's kind of the the that, that's kind of the labor of love, the the, yeah, the fun yeah. stuff where you get to bring everything to the table and 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 use it to to create theater and create create storytelling, which is which is near my heart. But 
Now I wanted to ask, well, asking the same question, but in terms mm -hmm. of liquid lead, what is your favorite style of dance to change leads in? Yeah, Latin style is definitely the easiest, uh, partially just because the, the room navigation issue is much less, you know, it's not like kind of taking the wheel in the middle of driving on the highway. Um, so, and it works, it comes up more often, especially from a social standpoint, if you're, if you're just out dancing, chances are you're going to get swings and salsas and cha-chas as, a, as opposed to a, a good tango. But so the Latin is, is a little more user-friendly on that on that front and the, and the little punctuation marks where you can set the offer up and and every both partners are static for a moment while there's a rock step or a link going on you're like ah, ah, ah. Okay. Um, so that that definitely you, you end up getting to use it more often um than, than in the the ball events but the waltzes and foxtrots being the tango is a little more you would think it would almost be inherently more a tango thing, considering how kind of ambivalent and contesting that dance is to, to begin with. The idea that you would be wrestling for the lead would just seem like a natural evolution of tango. Um, but war of legs could be the war of frame as well. Um, but especially in waltz and in foxtrot, uh, it, can be, it can be quite fun mm -hmm. while in flight to sneak it around and, and, and in mid motion. That is, is a very cool feeling. Um, and, and that moment, that little blink of surprise, like, oh, okay, yeah, don't mind if I do. Um, it, it's, it's certainly a lot of fun. It's, just, it's a different skill set because you've got that extra, I've got to navigate the room and, and, right. and know when, when, what part of the phrase are you in so that I'm not right. sticking in or, or handing it over in the middle of something half syncopated and complicated. Nice, nice. Well, thank you for that. Michelle, do you have any other questions? <laughs> I'm completely out of questions. Oh, I've had so many questions. It's been delightful, first of all. So thank you so much, Jeff. Yes. Oh, um, in the workshops that you host and your attendance, do you have uh, a balance between same-sex couples or transgender? And you know, what is your attendance on the workshops? Because I'm just mm -hmm. curious about who's, who's being drawn? Who's the ones that are intrigued about the attendance to your groups? Uh, well, it's interesting because the, the, the events that we get invited to tend to fall into either being a very LGBTQ focused yep. event or a very conventional dance space. I would say probably the most kind of melting pot mixture was, was the So You Think and Consent weekend. Right. Because um, we had um, everybody across the, across the map there, um, partially because of the Planned Parenthood banner uh, and the yep. idea of consent was such a, that's such a kind of an umbrella and, and universal con consideration that it spoke to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, if, if it's a fairly typical kind of dance Congress weekend where it's, it's a lot more of, you know, the, the occasional same sex couple or, or set of dancers will be there, but it's mainly conventional male female partnerships that are there. Then going to a, a GSA conference or a, a pre pride festival, then you've got a, a main focus there. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that brush, again, kind of led by this, this NDCA thing and the, and the competitive floor opening up of dance just being dance and it doesn't feel like, well, you have to go to these dances if, it's, if you're an LGBTQ dancer right. and you have to go to these dances if you're, if, if you're a conventional or mainstream dancer, that those things will start to mix out uh, and, and dance just as dance. Uh, I'm looking forward to those. It, that's coming, I think. I'm starting to see uh, whiffs of that. And again, the, 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 the representation and the presence of unconventional or, or LGBTQ uh, and, and, and gender fluid and, uh, and non-conformist couples in mainstream spaces and it being okay there um, then brings more people. So then it's back and forth. I, uh, uh, kind of a, I guess you could say a metaphor parallel. It was a dance in Toronto that was run for years, uh, specifically by a woman who wanted to get international and American style dancers on the same dance floor. Ah. <laughs> just so they could be around each other and see and maybe even mix and mingle and dance with each other. Exactly. But just to get those two dance styles on the floor so that to try and kind of bring down this, well, it's either A or it's B and they're completely different things. And it's oh. like, you know what? It's just, it's Foxtrot. Like it's just dance. <laughs> yeah, just go dance and have fun. And, you know, um, and, and it was a lovely event. I remember attending several of those. Uh, it was just a lovely thing and to have the mixing mingle and to see kind of the, you know, international dancers look, oh, what are they doing? And then, oh, oh, what's that? And even a little bit of chatting back and forth and they were getting up and dancing with each other or at least sharing the floor. And it wasn't, a, oh, well, you know, what are you doing? Like it's just getting that out of there. Um, and hopefully, the, hopefully we are in a very wonderful phase of that 
part of the evolution of dance altogether. Mm -hmm. Just this acceptance, American, international, same couple, traditional couple, whatever it may be, just letting it all melt together because that is what we hope to see as we're part of this world, right? And I would say my, my one little uh, optimism or hope or thing I, I, I nurture and maybe, maybe a sniff I, see, I foresee coming, American Smooth has done that in a couple of ways already. Um, and I think as the, ve as the vehicle for that is likely going to be kind of the, the, the front runner, the tip of the spear, uh, within the last couple of years, they finally get, brought American Smooth over to Black Bull. Um, first right. is that exhibition sort of thing, and everybody just went bananas for it. And now it's there as an ongoing thing. And so it's kind of pushed some of that, well, that American style thing. So it, is, it, is, it has been a nice ambassador to get more open and, and more exchange of ideas and more going on that front. So it, it has brought American style dancing into spaces that it wasn't really being, you know, it wasn't, wasn't invited or wasn't permitted. So it, is, it has been an ambassador there. And when I look at, and we talk about like the, the NDCA rule changes includes professional. I mean, we're probably a ways away from seeing same sex pairs in a final at like Ohio. Uh, but my, my gut instinct is that smooth will potentially be the first one that gets that. Um, I would agree with you in anticipation that that's probably a much safer avenue for precisely just because of, you know, there's some traditional things on the international side that are going to be a little harder to break. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, and the, the training for international is, is quite intensive and the Latin side of things, there's the, the, the sexual sexuality and gender stuff is much more kind of aggressive in your face in the Latin space. That's so just kind of the attitude of it, which right. makes the, like the, the alarms I was talking about with Trevor and I that we don't set off, that makes it tougher that if you're going to, well, if, if a man's going to be following, if he's going to be, or if he is a, if he is a feminine follower, feminine lead even, right. how that, you know, there's a whole host of issues to try and climb over there. Whereas within Smooth, specifically, there's a lot more freedom, there's a lot more openness, and, and, and it's more about the lines and the flow of the movement and the, even, even the, the, typical male feel male female where they're, they're two halves of the same body rather than two individual bodies conversing back and forth so I just the, the the ability for same sex pairings to get in there and not feel like it's stand standing out or th I, I see smooth as probably the the first ambassador to to that and looking forward to it but that, yeah. that would be my that would be my prediction is, is that that it, it's been an ambassador in some ways already that it will it will most likely be the the first first set that, that, that gets there too. Yes, we'll have to have another uh, another podcast, David, when that all happens. Yes, yes, yeah, well. <laughs> like, uh, we said it here first. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, we'd love to have you back again to, oh, to talk about it. that, Jeff. So, Jeff, I just want to say thank you so much for oh, wow. agreeing to come and talk to Michelle and I and our audience. This is such a fascinating thing. I want to thank you personally because you've opened my eyes to a new way of thinking about dance. I'd love to catch one of your workshops at some point, but without having ever taken a workshop, just trying it out with my partner and, and working things out, I'm having a lot of fun with it. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to do more. I think uh, many people would have uh, fun with it if they, if they have the opportunity to try it. So I encourage everyone to Try and catch a workshop with Jeff or Trevor. Uh, we'll put links in where you might be able to find those things. But uh, even if you don't have that opportunity, just give it a go. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be a competitive endeavor, even just, as I said. If, even if you only do it a little bit, it's, it can, in a way, reintroduce you to a familiar friend. Uh, you know, if, if dancing is something that you do, it's, it's a new level of appreciating what actually goes on with two bodies interacting by just getting a chance, it's that partner empathy, just to understand what your partner goes through and maybe why they give you a dirty look when you try and spin them for the fourth time in a row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Just those little, those little moments that just bond us all together. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, thank you again, Jeff, and we wish you well. Oh, and... thank you, my pleasure. Okay. Very nice Remember, to meet you. Say yes to things, say yes to things. Yeah.